Today we're going to talk a little bit about culture. And of course, culture is one of the major themes that we've talked about through the entire semester. But tonight I want to focus in on some of the important concepts that really help us to understand why culture is such an integral part of marketing and especially, of course, as we go across cultures. So as So as you can see here, we can define culture simply as the accumulation of shared meanings, rituals, which we'll talk more about, norms, and traditions among the members of an organization or society. And it's so important to remember that we cannot understand the large majority of consumption choices that people within a culture make without understanding the cultural context in which they're made. So culture truly is the lens through which people view products. So if you look at an ad like this, uh, this is an ad for a, a malt liquor drink. It used to be sold in the United States, is no longer. It's called Zima, but it's made by Coors. And uh, you can see here when we, when we transplant this product to Japan, we see a lot of other things going on in, in an advertisement that we obviously wouldn't see in an American ad. So if you look closely at a lot of the details here, and there are many of them, you're, you're going to see some very typical Japanese design elements. And uh, that uh, these include, of course, the, the animation, the quality that makes it look uh, Looks, that makes it look like an animated movie in a way. And uh, note in particular the Western features on the face of the boy. And it is a boy as opposed to an adult who is drinking this alcoholic beverage. So uh, definitely a lot going on there that we wouldn't have seen in a Zima ad or any kind of beer ad, certainly, in the United States. Here we have an American product made by Procter & Gamble, Tide detergent. Often in the U.S., of course, we're going to see maybe some housewife who's using the product and she's happy because her clothes are clean and her family loves her and all that stuff. Whereas here in China, we're going to see that maybe some uh, iconic Chinese elements um, are invoked in this ad for detergent. Obviously, not something we're going to see here in the States. So often we are going to assume that our viewers or our listeners have a cultural frame of reference that will allow them to understand what may be some very obscure uh, kinds, of, kinds of references. Uh, here, this is actually an Israeli ad for a travel agency that sells all kinds of tickets to concerts and things like that. And uh, again, if you look closely, um, I think most of you can probably figure out that this is a takeoff on a very famous Beatles uh, album cover, um, Abbey Road. And uh, there's a lot of detail going on here. And, but, but the basic idea, of course, is that, uh, hey, Paul McCartney's not going to be with us for that long, so maybe you want to buy a ticket to his concert. And uh, again, uh, without explicitly stating this, the, the people who create the ad are going to assume that we're going to get the references here. So when we look at new products, when we look at innovations uh, in, in products that designs or, or in advertising as well, of course, uh, we have to remember that we're looking at a window into what is going on in that culture at that time. So. We can argue perhaps whether advertising or marketing creates culture, but there's no question that it reflects culture. So, for example, when we look at the TV dinner that was introduced back in the late 1950s, this was an important indicator of changes in family structure where families, for better or worse, were no longer sitting around a dining room table, but in fact, we're often sitting around uh, what's been called the electronic campfire or the television set, which is now educating people about the, uh, the priorities in that culture. 
We look at other more, more recent uh, products. We can see, for example, cosmetics that, uh, that are not animal tested, uh, you know, plays to people's uh, priorities about pollution and animal rights and so on. We talked a bit about changes in sex roles. So when companies start marketing condoms in pastel carrying cases targeted to females, obviously that's a change uh, in attitudes and sending a message about who is supposed to take or at least share responsibility for sexual hygiene and so on. So when we want to try to compare and contrast different cultures around the world, and companies often want to do this because we're trying to, in many cases, figure out where would be a logical place perhaps to try to expand our marketing efforts. Uh, some cultures are going to be easier to penetrate than others simply because they may be relatively similar to our own culture, keeping in mind that no two cultures are identical, you know, even if people speak the same language. So uh, American and British cultures are very, very different, even though on the surface the language appears to be fairly similar. So let's review some of these systems quickly. This is in, in your chapter in the book, but, uh, but one of these is ecology, which means, if you studied biology, the way a system adapts to its habitat. So when we look at, at the use of physical space, for example, we often see big differences between cultures that have the luxury of lots of open spaces versus cultures like Japan, for example, where there's often very cramped conditions, especially in uh, Tokyo and other big cities. And so you're going to see that consumer behavior as a result is going to, to vary between these two kinds of cultures. So what, you, what you're going to see here is how one person in Hong Kong has adapted to ecology that is a very, very cramped apartment by doing some ingenious things. Why, how I can do so many things within the 360 square feet. 
is everything is uh, organic and always not in a mode of permanent position. The second one is actually my laundry room. It's a washing and drying machine. And after washing and drying, I, what I did this morning, I put the clean clothes here in the stacks, pretty much after that. <laughs> Another important thing is again, uh, after finish the washing and drying, the laundry room disappear. This movement is actually one of the most important designs. It's to make the operation uh, user friendly so that you want to do it all the time. Yeah. And that's why the handle design is actually very important. This is the Vegas wall with 3,000 compatches. Because it's heavy, so it's actually more stable. And actually, you can still pull it with uh, one hand. My trouble is uh, I have too much storage. They are still empty, some of them. Yeah. So, this is my problem. <laughs> I think a lot of people are jealous. <laughs> well, I really have too much storage. It's like my spa product. <laughs> so it's like a spa wall, I would say. And so after moving the second wall, this become my... Oh, uh, well actually it's the spa. The bathtub, which uh, I think hold the record on in Hong Kong, is usually bathtub in Hong Kong is where you just have to throw your feet inside. I try and enjoy the bathing in the morning with the natural light there. And I imagine it would be quite interesting to do playing hide and seek in my home because everything's moving. I think the kids will love it. Since this wall is so uh, light, it's for me it's like surfing. Another major idea consideration is I want to put everything on the side so that what's left behind is actually more or less half the area. That means uh, like 180 square feet, totally empty. So I think this is another kind of luxury for Hong Kong people. There's such an empty space here. So I could do yoga too easily. Okay, so this my version of sofa bed. So below the bed is the sitting. Actually, when I sit here, it's like uh, sitting on the on the train <laughs> compartment. Well, I'm not sure because of this movement. I think this is also a gym for me as well. <laughs> the, the the screen you have actually is the uh, movie screen. Actually, I I don't need a curtain. This is my curtain. It's not that big actually, but uh, since my home is so small, so you feel like uh, it's a really big the screen. I remember when I visited a friend who got a, a big house, and then we watched television, and then even though the television is big, but the living room is too big, so we are like, I need a telescope on it. But here, I think it's a good proportion, like for four or six people together. This is the only part that is actually a product, I didn't design this thing. Yeah, a lot of people's homes are small, but for the shower, since everybody has to do it all the time, why don't you make it a little bit larger? So as a result, you could have a luxury of uh, wandering around the shower tray, <laughs> cubicle. And actually, during the party, uh, it's uh, the telephone booth. You want to make a call? <laughs> <laughs> After lots of complaints from my friend, this in my previous version, uh, I have a very open bathroom, so now it's fully uh, enclosed. If you want. Yeah. Okay, my actually the door is uh, actually one sheet of metal being still friendly. So it's so another important design for tight space is the slim design. So a lot of the wall construction are actually uh, paper thin you would say. So the shelf as well. It's paper thin. Oh you can see I have too many storage, yeah. Too many, it's far too many. I have to wash my hair in the wash basin, it's too big. Everything's bigger than usual. <laughs> well, 
unfortunately, I got too, too many stuff here on the table. Actually, but actually, the table worked like a Swiss Army knife. I can roll it out to, yeah, to the middle so that I could have a dining table for five people. Actually, next month, I'll, I'll have like 10 people coming here. <laughs> standing, I mean, standing capacity is 20. <laughs> I think it's good, a uh, nice proportion. Even you, you don't need to yell at each other. <laughs> it's nice to see the reflection, double, so it's like double or triple. My idea of the mirror is actually not to have the reflection mainly. It's a side effect, but the main idea is to hide away the checks because you can see I have a 13 checks on the scene, which is quite busy. If I don't have the mirror, it will be very busy to see. Nothing's really high tech <laughs> here. It's just a lot of the checks are proprietary and nothing, no big deal. But it's reliable, good, and actually they're not expensive. Yeah. I have to close it. Also to subdivide the room. So uh, I take the bath in the morning, I'll, uh, yeah. Of course, uh, it's no big deal these days. Uh, my home is fully automated. I could use my mobile to control a lot of the uh, appliances. Like most architects, we are they're obsessed with gadgets, but uh, uh, to me, the, there's a balance between automation and, yeah. Sometimes I still want to control things by myself. Like the hi-fi system, the music system. I don't want to put it into the, the computer. It's quite pleasant, actually. I always argue, actually, how, how quick you need for, for your home. And also, if you are in a big cities, you are using a lot of resources on the city. So you're not just living in your home. Yeah. So the city should be your home. So in that sense, what you need to occupy in your private home doesn't need to be that big sometimes. Yeah, because you're... You should be always out, out of your home, uh, enjoying life in the city with your friends, with your family. So, what I argue is the city is your home, not just your home. I think you can see there that, uh, you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And this is a great example of consumer ecology or adapting to your environment. Another dimension that's important is social structure, the way that we maintain an orderly social life. So all of the uh, groups in, that we interact with, uh, for example, uh, whether it's a nuclear family versus an extended family, and that's gonna have a big impact on demand for various kinds of products and services, uh, such as the size of houses that are built, whether the house should be built um, with room for multiple generations, etc. Ideology refers to the mental characteristics of a people, that is, how do people basically think or what we call their worldview and that, that's going to refer to their uh, basic values that they share, what it means to be fair, what, it, what are good things, what are bad things, uh, what are moral things, and also what are aesthetically uh, positive or, or negative. We see that that is going to vary as we move across cultures. Power distance is a very interesting dimension, um, and this refers to the way in which we experience and the, uh, I guess you would say, the uh, distinct levels of power within a society. So in some societies, uh, sorry to pick on Japan again, but uh, Japan is characterized as having very high power distance, which means that there are very strict vertical relationships. It's fairly easy to tell who has power and who doesn't. And other societies like the United States or especially, let's say, Australia are going to be very flat in terms of power distance. So there's going to be much more informality going on. So again, in a society like Japan, we're going to see 
uh, a lot of professions who, that who wear uniforms uh, more than we would see here in the states because people are much more clearly marked in terms of their occupations and relative status. Another dimension is uncertainty avoidance. Um, in every culture, we see that people evolve certain institutions to help them deal with risk, to help them deal with the unknown. For example, how do we deal with death? And that's where sometimes organized religion is going to come in. Various kinds of rituals uh, are going to evolve that we'll talk about some more. Uh, I should note, by the way, that these are all dimensions that were um, that were proposed and tested um, by a Dutch fellow named Geert Hofstede. Uh, you'll see him uh, written about in, in the chapter. And he has very, a very extensive set of measures of these things uh, that go across cultures. So for your projects, I would strongly suggest that you at least take a look at this as a way to help you understand some cultures that might be more similar to the one that you're used to versus others that are more distant. Another dimension we've already talked about quite a bit, and that's masculinity, femininity, femininity, excuse me, the degree to which sex roles are clearly delineated. So as you can guess, in more traditional societies, uh, we tend to have a, 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 a high degree of demarcation here where there are certain occupations, there are certain uh, products, etc., that are clearly appropriate for one gender versus the other, whereas in more uh, modern, evolving societies, these expectations are blurring uh, quite a bit. And so that, that may also relate to, uh, to morality, uh, for example, the extent uh, to which nudity is tolerated in a society. So uh, this is a British ad for Levi's, and uh, you can see here that, you know, I'm not sure why they Think they're going to sell jeans when nobody's wearing any, but um, this is not an ad that we would expect to see here in, in the U.S. Another dimension that I think you're familiar with is individualism versus collectivism. So uh, I believe we've talked about this, uh, the extent to which the culture prioritizes the welfare of the individual as opposed to the group. And so, um, <clears throat> at least traditionally in, in uh, collectivist societies, the, the welfare of the group tends to be paramount, whereas in individualist societies such as the U.S., Australia, uh, uh, Great Britain, Canada, etc., the individual is, is prioritized. And so, um, you know, doing it your own way, do your own thing, and so on, is going to be much more of a positive uh, in those cultures. So let's talk a little bit now about values and norms. A value is a very general idea about good and bad goals or objectives. Every culture has values. Um, many cultures share values, like let's say freedom, for example, but some cultures are going to prioritize some goals over others. So it's not that a culture doesn't have these values. It's a question of how important they are in terms of guiding behavior. From these flow what we call norms. So a, a norm is a specific rule that dictates something that is right or wrong. And obviously every culture has norms. Um, it's very good to know what, the, what these are. Sometimes they're quite subtle. Sometimes they're literally written down. So if, if I want to know, for example, what is, how much is it appropriate to tip in a restaurant in a certain country, and nowadays I can just Google that and, uh, and find out whether it's appropriate to leave a tip, and if so, how much, uh, and so on. So needless to say, when you travel, and I think everybody, I think all of you have had these experiences as you go from one country to another, you realize that things you take as normal or appropriate uh, really are relative. So the same behavior in one country that's, that's quite appropriate might be inappropriate in another. 
uh, as this ad uh, I think illustrates. And a custom is similar to a norm, but it, it tends to control more basic behaviors. It's usually something that is taught from one generation to another. Um, so in a culture, we learn how to, uh, how to conduct a, a wedding ceremony, how to allocate the, the kinds of, of labor that we do in a household, etc. And we know that, you know, uh, what's, what's great in our culture may be really weird in another. So I, I like this ad for Land Rover. Uh, many, many times you're, you're asked to eat foods that you might consider to be, let's say, a bit out of the ordinary, uh, like these stewed eyeballs that might be served in, in Africa. <laughs> and um, as, you, as you're probably aware, uh, are aware, you need to be quite careful about making faces, you know, when you're traveling in another country and people ask you to eat things that are a bit strange because you may be violating certain expectations there. So continuing with that, um, a more, pronounced more, is a custom with a strong moral overtone. So uh, uh, this might be something like a prohibition against incest or cannibalism, something that many people in a society are going to be very unhappy about if you violate that. Whereas a convention is a norm that Re, that regulates the conduct of, of everyday life. So uh, uh, conventions about how, what types of furniture you should buy, what types of clothing you should wear, uh, how to conduct a dinner party and so on. These are examples of conventions. Okay, let's move on now and talk a bit about myths and rituals, which are underlying structures, underlying structures that often are invisible to us, yet are extremely important, uh, really the, the building blocks of, of a culture. So when we talk about myths, for example, we talk about the stories that a culture tells that basically reinforce the values and norms and priorities of that culture. So a myth we can define as a story but a story that contains symbolic elements. And these elements express the emotions and ideals of a culture. Uh, a story often involves a conflict between opposing forces. And, and so we talk about the principle of binary opposition, which means that we might have two, val two values that get pitted against each other, such as, for example, nature versus technology. Uh, that is a very common type of binary opposition. So uh, products, in fact, if we look at advertising, sometimes products are, determ are defined in terms of binary opposition. So they might be defined not by what they are, but rather by what they're not. I can't believe it's not butter or this is not your father's Oldsmobile. And of course, myths often involve some element of magic. You know, things happen uh, bad things happen mysteriously to people who violate the, uh, the norms of a culture. Uh, and so you want to try to figure out what those norms are and probably a good idea not to violate them. And often these stories are expressed in advertising. So if you look, for example, here, uh, as most of you know, a dragon is very important in Chinese culture and uh, it usually stands for good luck. And so, uh, you know, not that unusual to invoke that kind of a mythical uh, element into a, an ad for, let's say, a car like a Subaru. And again, these stories tend to be, be very important. Um, we often know them very well. They get expressed in advertising, even when they're not explicitly referred to. So here in a campaign for Eclipse Gum, you see the, the story of Romeo and Juliet, uh, updated, of course, because now he's delivering pizza. But again, there's a cultural referent here. We don't really have to be told that this is a reference to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in order to understand it. Another execution from the same campaign. Now here we have a story about Prince Charming. 
And by the way, you'll notice that this is, well, I don't know, is it a sexist story? But it's certainly uh, reinforcing traditional expectations about masculinity and femininity because, of course, she is the helpless damsel in distress. And the only way that, um, that she can be saved is by the man who comes in to uh, save her at the last minute. So these stories live on. Sometimes they get updated. Uh, a story like uh, Little Red Riding Hood, which, uh, as you'll read in the book, has actually, has actually gone through several permutations. It used to actually uh, refer to a story about adultery and incest. And that basic story gets played out over and over again in advertising in different cultures where we have that little red riding hood imagery and people just seem to understand what that is so here we see little red riding hood in scandinavia here we see her uh, in a drunk driving <laughs> campaign uh, so, uh, from miami and uh, kind of a humorous one here for for wonder bra we can also talk about a monomyth, which means a basically a myth that is so powerful, so pervasive that it has traveled around the world. So here in this Indian ad for Ariel detergent, it says, don't let a stain ruin your day. And obviously the story is about Superman and he's, uh, you know, his cape is in the laundry. So that so Superman is an example of a monomyth. You see that kind of imagery popping up all over the place. Here's a superhero in Australia and this whole superhero uh, legend, you know, that we're so infatuated with just appears over and over and over again. So when we talk about mythic structure, we mean how, well, how is the, how is the story structured? There often are Again, you have that binary opposition, often with some kind of mediating character. That is, uh, it often takes the, the form of an animal, doesn't have to, but some kind of referee, if you will, that links the two elements like nature versus technology together. So cars are a great example, the conflict between nat uh, nature and technology, and one way to kind of soften that conflict is to give cars names that link them to nature, like, uh, like animals, jaguars, and mustangs, and so on. The talking snake in the Garden of Eden uh, is a classic example of a, of, uh, of a mythic structure, and, and um, again, lots of symbolism here. The snake, of course, is the devil who is tempting Adam and, and Eve and, and again, remember that, uh, you know, these symbols make their way into lots of different branding applications. So when you think about that apple on your computer and you see there's a bite taken out of that apple, I'll leave it to you to figure out what that actually means. So here in this Italian ad for a car, you can see that, that story being repeated again without any words. And what's the, the underlying story here? well, you're going to be tempted by this car. Now we move on to the idea of a ritual, a set of symbolic behaviors that occur in a fixed sequence. And rituals are extremely important, even though uh, we're not often aware of them, but they are really underlying a lot of the relationships that we have with, uh, with products. So there, we find ritual elements in a lot of different areas. Uh, anything from birthday cakes and diplomas to, uh, to giving, giving out cigars when a woman has a baby, the greeting cards that we give all the time, uh, the rituals of coffee drinking. Basically, that's what Starbucks has figured out. And so there are a lot of different, really very interesting rituals that... Uh, that really underlie the reasons for our attraction to, to a lot of different products. And we can talk about different categories of consumer rituals as your chapter does. So chapter talks about grooming rituals, for example, again, this idea of binary opposition. In this case, when you, when you do a grooming ritual, 
you're moving from private to public. That is, we talk about putting on your face, putting on your makeup in some cases, going out into the world and then coming back at night, maybe taking off your work clothes, putting on your pajamas, whatever it takes, um, or maybe transitioning from work to leisure. So taking a bath, for example, uh, is, is very common uh, to, to have that kind of ritual element there. We can also talk about rites of passage where we move from one status to another. And these usually uh, take, uh, go in, in three stages. So you, you can think about a caterpillar who goes into an intermediate stage. That is, the caterpillar goes into a cocoon where it's, it's not a caterpillar, but it's not yet a butterfly. And then it emerges at the end uh, with a new status as the, or form as the butterfly. So that same patterns that we call separation, liminality, or just being on the threshold, and aggregation where you take on a new status, we see this repeated over and over again. Think about people who go into the military and um, you know they, the first thing they do is they shave their hair, they take away their civilian clothing, but they're not yet soldiers because they still have to go through boot camp if they survive boot camp, they're going to come out the other end as that butterfly, so to speak, that is a new status as soldier. And another really important kind of consumer ritual, of course, is gift giving. Again, three stages where we make some assessment of our relationship with another person. Based on that, we go through some uh, ritual of presenting a gift and based on how the person accepts that gift, we reformulate uh, the, the status of our relationship. So, uh, for example, if uh, to give you a quick example, if uh, if two people are dating, and they've been dating for let's say a year, and then uh, if it's a heterosexual couple, and the and the man buys the woman a ring of some kind, gives her the ring. Uh, that probably will redefine the seriousness of their relationship. And with gift giving, we also talk a lot about self gifts because increasingly people are going through these the same process uh, by buying themselves various uh, treats and so on to reward themselves, to cheer themselves up. You probably heard the term retail therapy. There's actually a lot to that. So here we have a consumer ritual, again, the bath ritual, and you can look at the copy here. It says a Calgon, Calgon bath transports you. So what it, it says, Calgon, take me away. In other words, take me away from the stresses of, the, of daily life and put me into my private self. Um, and there's an entire, of course, bathing ritual around that. So that's about all I've got to say about culture. Uh, I've just tried to hit some of the high points for you. Everything I've talked about here is discussed in the chapter on culture. So please read that and I will see you next week.